Well, hello there. Welcome to our channel. We are the Two Wheel Buckeyes. I'm Keith. I'm Dawn. And part of our Smoky Mountain adventure, one of the stops is we're going to go through the Great Smoky Mountain Heritage Center. You know, not only are the Smoky Mountains a, a beautiful site, but uh, there's a lot of culture and history here too. So we wanted to learn a little bit more about it and wanted to take you along with us and so you can learn a little bit more about the history of the Smoky Mountains. So we're gonna go in and show you what it's all about. Well, we'll start a little bit on the inside. We do have an inside exhibit. And what's Smoky Mountain history without the black bears, which the they black say bears. there's approximately 1,800 to 2,000 black bears living in the Great Smoky Mountains which is a population density of about two black bears per square mile. And we haven't seen one yet. <laughs> and bears can run up to 30 miles an hour in a good tree climber. Is, so you, needless to say, you can't get away. Uh, I, can, I can do about <laughs> four miles an hour. <laughs> so these are just... Artifacts. Little artifacts and how they dig, actually. And here are some of the things they have found in their excavations. A bowl from the Cherokee. Some of the items that were used for hunting. Spears and bows and a blowgun. This is how some of the housing evolved. This one here is 1000 BC to 1000 AD. This is 1000 AD to 1600 AD. And this is 1600 to 1800 AD. And the same here. And if you want to see 2023, we'll show you some cabins along the parkway. <laughs> For those of you who didn't know, there is a Cherokee alphabet. This is kind of cool, showing the uh, some of the music and games that they played. This. And this is a whole separate area you can go to, but it's kind of talks about the Cades Cove area of the Smoky Mountains, and that's a definitely an awesome place to go to if you're in the area. Highly recommend Cades Cove. Yep, a lot of history there. Kind of shows how everything started, and really the Gatlinburg area. So this is a little description of the housing in the early days. This was a porch. It says porches were added to cabins to increase both living and working space. Many domestic chores were performed on the porch, such as spinning, weaving, and dyeing. And the fireplace it was multifunctional. It served as an open hearth for the preparation of meals, a heat source during the cold mountain winters, and an important social area. Some of the food they ate, the primary, was pork and corn. And by 1849, Tennessee became known as the hog and hominy state. Pork was preferred over beef because it was easier to preserve. It did not require refrigeration. Who knew? Some of the tools, the rug beater side is what a bedroom might look like, a blanket chest they had, what the beds may look like in the cabins. And these just show some of the tools. The cantilever barn you'll see outside, very popular. You will see those. Blacksmithing was a way of life and surprisingly beekeeping. And what would the mountains be without mountain the mountain music. music? And not the Alabama kind of mountain music. <laughs> See what a church or a school looked like Schoolhouse. in Cades Cove. Since most early churches were only used on Sunday, their dual role as schools provided an improvement over the primitive field schools in terms of size. So now we're going to take a little walk around the outdoor area that has some actual cabins, 
farms, things like that that we can take a look at. We're going to stop in here for a minute first. <laughs> Got to go. Unleash that breakfast. Yeah. That is the outhouse. Cold in the winter, hot in the summer, smelling and infested with flies, wasps, and spiders. Built anywhere from 50 to 150 feet from the main house. And that's just the way it was in Cage Cove. All right, so this is a smokehouse. After the first hard frost, the smokehouse became a busy place. This was where meat for the family was cured and stored. Hogs were the most common source of meat. Okay, this is what they would call a cantilever barn. And specifically, they're calling this Maples Pole Barn. The Maples family was one of the first settlers in the Cades Cove area. This is the oldest known cantilevered pole barn from the Sugarlands community, also known as the Gatlinburg area. They wanted to point out the wooden hinges. It says 90% of all cantilever barns built in the United States are found in Sevier and Blount counties. This specific barn was the Maples Pole Barn. It was built in the 1820s out in the Sugarlands community or the Gatlinburg area. So they call this the Montvale Station. And that's what the fares were back then when you wanted to pick up the train or the coach. And they had a bed and breakfast here. Because. Twelve and a half cents for a half bed. <laughs> Twenty-five cents if you wanted the whole bed. I would just be curious who got the other half. Imagine when you go to check into a hotel nowadays. If you said I would, I would just like <laughs> half of a room, and somebody else is going to be in the other half. That would be awkward. Yeah. The bull's horn. So this, this horn was used to alert the stable help that the stagecoach had arrived and a fresh team of horses would be needed. So this building is a Montvale station built in the 1830s by Dan Font. Montvale station was used as a post office serving eight families in the Montvale Springs area and as a stagecoach stop for the Montvale Springs Resort. All right, and the next stop along here we're going to call this, they're calling this the Cantwell House. Watch your head. Typical home of that time. You can see the bed. Mattress. Chicken and goose not only provided food for the family, but feathers to be used as a filler for the pillows. How about that? corner cupboard. With limited space in log cabins, the triangular shaped corner cupboard was a way to conserve wall space. So between 1892 and 1895, James Cardwell built their first home, the first family home located between Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg. Him and his wife had 10 children, but only six of them survived. And they all stayed in this tiny little house. Kind of cool. Newspapers and other salvaged scraps of paper were used to wallpaper the cabin. Or if you wanted to make a cabinet, you just made little curtains. Typical home. There's the fireplace we talked about. And you can't go upstairs, but this one had a particular upstairs. Babies and small children slept downstairs with their parents, often in a cradle or trundle bed, while the older children slept upstairs. Our next stop is Wilder's Chapel. Pretty self-explanatory what this is. Yeah. 
Fuse. How cool is this right here? Don't see too many of these around. This barn, thought to have been built around 1886, is in excellent condition because the perimeter had been enclosed to provide more space for storage and animals. Look at some of the equipment that was used. Upper part of the barn. We go around to this side of the barn. You can see here we have a very old John Deere tractor. Doesn't say what year it is. Maybe there's some tractor experts out there that can leave a comment and Tell us what year this was. So this is actually the wheelwright shop. The blacksmith was in here. Shoeing horses was originally considered a medical procedure to be performed by a vet. Then it became the job of the blacksmith since he made the iron shoes. You see a lot of the equipment here. It was a very important person in the... And then you also had a wheelwright built and repaired all kinds of wheels, not just those of a wagon. That's a steam engine, the Baxter steam engine of 1868. It sat on top of the boiler to minimize heat loss. This portable boiler was designed by William Baxter in 1868. So they call this the set-off house. According to a former resident of a set-off house, the houses were set so close to the railroad tracks that the family's daily routine was interrupted when the train carrying logs passed by. Fearing an accident from logs rolling off the train, the family would run from their home into the yard away from the tracks. Only after the train safely passed would they return inside. All right, the next building is, they say, the sawmill. says the advent of sawmills brought a new term to housing in America called box houses. These houses were no longer made from hand honed logs cut and shaped with hand saws and axes but made of boards that could be produced more quickly and efficiently by sawmills. Okay, our next stop they're calling the print shop. Obviously, this was very important. This shows a little history of the, the daily times of Maryville. Shows some of the equipment that was used. So this equipment was the property of Floyd Hamilton, who was the advertising manager for the Daily Times. Printing, that printing press was built in 1881. And some of the images of the Maryville Times. And some more of the equipment from that time. Okay, this is where, let's just say, the moonshine was made and delivered. You can imagine back in the day, 
that's how it was transported. And you can imagine back in the day how it was also transported this way. It's like a basement down there. This has a lower level. I don't know if you can really see it, but it goes down to a lower level. And th but this is where the moonshine was made. This is where Sugarland had its roots. <laughs> And this is how he got around town, selling the moonshine. This may have also been a vehicle that was used in the transportation of said moonshine. So this was the Williams Still. It was built in 1960 by Charles L. Williams, who kept the entire operation hidden under his shed. So that's why you saw the how they moved it, lowered it from upstairs, or they took it up over there to actually transport it. Yeah, you can see where it was either dropped or lifted up, probably at that point to transport it. Interesting story in their constant battle with the government and the revenuers that they had gone to the grocery store to buy a very large, large quantity of sugar that they needed. Uh, on their way home, they had a flat tire and the first person that stopped to help was a police officer. They couldn't very well open the trunk to get the spare tire out because he would see all the massive amount of sugar in there and would know exactly what they were up to. So they convinced the police officer that everything was okay, and he went on his merry way, and the sugar made it home. This is what they're calling the Maples Cabin, and if anybody knows anything about the area, you know the prevalence of the Maples name. Hi. There. Hi. Loom because uh -huh. you have a roller up here which controls these two rollers, okay. which controls which shaft goes up, which raises which cord, which of the threads you want on the warp raised. That creates a space right here for the shuttle to go through. Okay. And then oh, that's wow. what makes the pattern because you'll see that different treadles have different shafts that they raise. Wow. Wow. So that's how that works. You wow. said it was from the 1930s? This was from the 1930s. Okay. Um, have you been over to the Davis cabin yet? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So over near the entrance, um, one of the cabins in theirs has a... Okay. I'm listening to over the <laughs> <laughs> It seems appropriate for you. So, uh -huh. But in the Davis cabin is an 1830s loan. Okay. Um, it's a lot bigger because it's a lot older. The, that one is inside the cabin. Okay. Um, they're just too big. Yeah. And you would set them up on the porch every spring. Okay. And use it when the weather is good enough. And then come fall when winter is starting, you disassemble it and put it back in the barn for winter. Oh, wow. So okay. When you look at that one, it, it's like this one. It's really kind of cool. As we wrap up episode six of our Smoky Mountain Adventure, we want to thank you for joining us and being a part of this journey. Your support means the world to us. But don't go away just yet. Next time in episode seven, we're going to take you to another amazing location with some beautiful views here in the Smoky Mountains. Trust us, you won't want to miss it. Wow, what an incredible day we've had exploring the Great Smoky Mountain Heritage Center. From the fascinating exhibits to the rich history, it's been a journey back in time that we won't soon forget. We hope you've enjoyed this adventure as much as we have. So make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on so you don't miss out on any of our Smoky Mountain adventures. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. 
Until next time, keep exploring and we'll see you on the next adventure.